What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of Explicit Materia, where a nerdy drummer talks to his friends. Follow me on Twitter at The Wise Drums, Instagram at Wise Drums, Facebook at Wise Drums, or follow the Explicit Materia Facebook page. Of course, subscribe to youtube.com slash wise drums where i post clips of this podcast and other stuff like drum covers my let's play series called shane plays where me and a couple of my buddies we just play video games in this latest iteration it's just me and soren hansen and kyle lampy just playing some super nintendo classic so just check that out on the good old youtube so here's what you'll be experiencing this episode John Nettie joins me on the podcast today. Me and him go way back. Well, not way back. Kind of like 10 years. But that's kind of way back. Um, as he was the guy responsible for me tracking drums in Blackbird, one of Nashville's most awesome studios. And I'm not even... I, I don't care. I'm, na- I'm name dropping. Yeah. That was like a that was like dream come true for me. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> he, he was a great engineer and an equal in talent producer. Um, He has since put that stuff on hold to pursue other things like being a daddy twice over. Congratulations again, my friend. That's awesome. Uh, We get into his work in the music industry, how we met, uh, the gentrification um, issues uh, in Nashville, the state of journalism today, and dun-dun-dun, we talk about CrossFit. And we're going to move on to the episode in just a little bit here, but I I just want to say I, I really hope you guys are enjoying these podcasts as much as I am. Uh, this has just been a blast hanging out with all of my friends, new and old, talking about their lives and learning their different perspectives about things, even controversial subjects. And I, w- I just want to say this, if you're offended by something that I or one of the guests say, or if we're misinformed, hit me up in the YouTube comments or Twitter. Look, I consider myself an open-minded individual who is open to having his mind change, and you know, honestly, would love your feedback. At the, you know, what, at the end of the je- at the end of the day, I'm just a drumming nerd who loves to have conversations with his buddies. So, I mean, what the hell do I know, right? <laughs> All right, that's that. Let's move on. Here's John Nettie. I love it. Dog mug too. That's so cute. <laughs> it's a wiener mug. It is a wiener mug, because I'm a wiener dog lover. Mm. I almost said wiener lover, but I didn't yeah, want to give yeah. you the satisfaction. You corrected. I didn't want Not to give very you the gracefully. satisfaction. <laughs> was, I had three or four lined up right after that, but you didn't go there. <laughs> John Nettie. Yes. He's on the podcast. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm on a podcast. He's on a podcast. Which is a feat in and of itself. I'm really (laughs) glad that you don't have headphones because I would not be able to deal with the sound of my voice. (laughs) That's why why I do it. (laughs) So you said you... you listen. What other podcast do you listen to? Um, We we, we started talking about that when you got here. But like you said you listen to Mark Maron, which I need to start listening to. You know, I I very infrequently listen to him. I, I like his interviewing style a lot. What got me into him is what a lot of people listen to which is the president obama one right I and i started listening to it <laughs> uh, it's amazing it's amazing and that totally sold me on him um but i listened to to mark maron joe rogan um criminal you know a lot of npr ones 99 percent invisible pretty nerdy really cool one it's all about design Ooh. um uh, gosh i don't know what else uh maddox the best debate in the universe that guy's hilarious <laughs> Ruck is an idiot, if anyone's <laughs> listening to it that listens to that one. But uh, <laughs> anyways, yeah, I, I don't, I can't listen anymore right now without looking at my phone, which I put over there on purpose. But uh, <laughs> you don't have to. it's just all over the place. I like the science ones a lot. I like... Uh, does Neil deGrasse Tyson have a podcast? He does, but I don't like it. Really? Yeah, I love him, but I just, you know, his, his, the podcast didn't really catch me. I'll have to try it again, because I really do enjoy him, but... Yeah. Um, he does. It's he should just start talk. Right? He should just have a podcast that's just solely focused on debunking conspiracy theories. Nah, that's boring. <laughs> that's boring though. Why is that boring? No, that's not because he he's he's above that, right? Like yeah, he's got the science yeah. to prove it. Like you don't have to go up to him and say debunk this thing. He's he he's written books about you know and and does the work. Right? But you but you have to admit it's really satisfying to see him. Just it destroy is. flat earthers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty. It's, it's 
it's really easy to do. You don't need an astrophysicist for that one. Um, although I did listen to a really cool no, podcast. It was, a, it was an NPR story about how we take so much on faith, even though we're talking about science. Like the whole podcast talked about all these things. For instance, the earth being round. They had a huge conversation about how, how do you know? Do you really know? I mean, can you right now with whatever's in this room, prove it, you know, and, and discuss it in a way that is full of evidence and proof, right? No, you just know it, right? You were taught it. You believe it. You trust the people that were told you. So there's a lot of faith involved, even though it's a scientific discovery. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, or it's a scientific <clears throat> fact rather. So there is a really cool psychological side of that. Oh, also. I always thought that too. I always thought, well, you know, in defense of, <laughs> uh, as, as, as much as it you're, pains you're, me to defend flat earthers in their defense, yeah, if you walk outside with your own two eyes. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> you just defended flat earthers. That's really, I didn't mean to. I mean, I, mean, I, I don't, don't know if we can cuss on this, but that's fucked up. Man. <laughs> We're not even five minutes in this. We're thing. not even five minutes. I'm leaving. Fuck yeah. you. But. I mean, yeah, I mean, you walk outside, you're like, well, I mean, how do I know? I don't really know. You don't see, yeah, I mean, but that's that's the faith thing. Like, you put the faith in in the system. You were hopefully taught in school enough about the scientific method yeah. to have an understanding of of what they went through to prove these things. Oh, and, you know, we've got pictures of that shit. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> yeah, they release... Give me a break. At this point, <laughs> it's so fucking evident. You're an idiot. You guys are all idiots. Shut the hell up. Let's move on. <laughs> yeah. I'm talking about flat earthers. Yeah. <laughs> Just to clarify that. <laughs> That's me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, for those that don't know, Nettie, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna move on. So, Nettie is engineer extraordinaire. You have your own studio now. Had had closed. Okay. Yeah, lots of stories to catch up on. Okay, yeah, yeah. I haven't, I haven't. We haven't talked to each other Thanks, in like that two sucks. years. Pour that salt in the wound. I'm sorry. No. Nah. He's still. You're still a great engineer. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was all right. And producer, yeah. she produced a couple tracks for us, and we it was, sounded great. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. So what? Uh, so what are you doing now? I now am a full-time cybersecurity project engineer, which is a whole bunch of hooji wooji for network security, firewalls, and um, you know the type of stuff that that you see happening on the news when Experion gets hacked. I work with companies to not have that kind of crap happen. So wow, essentially. Um, I didn't. I, I knew you were smart. I didn't realize you. That's. I mean, you don't really have to be. That. No. Well, maybe you do. But the whole you fight hackers. I. You know, <laughs> my whole history has been mostly a a mixture of really technical. I love computers. You know, I slept through high school during the day, and I played with Linux servers at night. And I was in rock bands at night when I wasn't playing with my Linux servers. <laughs> I was the ultimate nerd shut-in guy. Um, and. That always played well with the engineering, right? Like it was a very, I was technical engineer. I wasn't a super musical guy. And um, my, I don't know, there's a whole backstory to how I ended up doing this after spending 15 years in the music industry, but. You might want to get a little bit closer to the mic. There. Oh, there you go. mic technique. See, it, I'm on the wrong mic. side of the glass. It, <laughs> I'm on the wrong side of the glass. <laughs> That's usually anyway, me. It's sorry. usually me coming over the talk back saying, "Hey, listen, I can't hear you. You're gonna have to. <laughs> you're gonna have to get better." How does it feel, you fuck? <laughs> it's great. It feels great. It's great. I don't have to look at the music. I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go on. Um, oh, you know, but I, I think your question was, you know, what are you doing, basically? And yeah. It's network security. You know, um, I I took that job about four months ago. I'd been consulting with this company on the side. I still had the studio. The studio wasn't doing so hot. Um, after about three years, we called it quits on the studio, and I took a full-time job doing this. So, yeah, it's really challenging. I'll say that because I spent so much time in the studio with really creative people and well, some not so creative people. Um, <laughs> it is Nashville, names. home of the of all <laughs> musicians. <laughs> But I, you know, found a way to relate a lot of what I learned in the music industry to this technical industry. And, and there are some things that I love about it a lot more than I love the music industry. And there's a lot of stuff I miss about the music industry. I'm sort of in the same boat, my friend. Yeah. In the technical world? Or are you like... No, not technical world, but just my... Uh... I wouldn't want to. Say, I wouldn't say bitterness against the <laughs> industry. Say that's a wrong. That's a wrong Jay. word. I'm say not Jay. bitter. 
I'm, I, I had a lot of fun, like, touring and The veins on his forehead are sticking out if you're watching the <laughs> video. I think he's bitter as hell. <laughs> I'm not bitter. Mm. A lot of my... I have some friends who are quite bitter. Because <laughs> yeah. this, this industry will... It's chew easy. you up and spit you yeah, it's out. It's easy to get that way. It really is, man. It really is. And you've seen it too. You've probably seen enough musicians who are just, they're trying so hard to do one thing yeah. and it just can't, just doesn't get there. So anyway, uh, yeah, just, just as a drummer, I never really focused on me. I was always in the back and I was always utilizing my skills to help someone else's project, yeah. which is what you do as a drummer. That's what you do. And you're, often loyal and i was loyal to my bands partly because they were all my best friends right um except for F- five knives who they're my great friends but you know yeah well the history was different yeah. yeah the history was different and i had a lot of fun with five knives and i got to do a lot of stuff that i dreamt of doing like touring and playing for i played for smashing pumpkin not for smashing pumpkins it opened up for smashing pumpkins that's great like the first th- four months i was in that band i was like awesome. oh my god this is yeah. awesome did you get to meet the band i did yeah. i got to meet billy yeah. i got to not shake his hand <laughs> because i did not know that he's a super germaphobe yeah he's a weirdo um, he's a little bit weird he's yeah. a little bit weird but he was he was nice the band was super nice but yeah. it was unfortunate because it was all new band members not to say that they were weren't incredible yeah but they weren't the original band you know, it was just only Billy. How long have they been around now? Oh, God, years. I mean, yeah. Years. <laughs> I feel like all the bands we grew up with that are still, like, the entity is there, but the original members, they're not. I mean, yeah. that's just the way it goes. I mean, we saw that with so many bands. Look at Gun and, Guns and Roses is, like, <laughs> a great example of that, right? Where they they all just went and did their own thing and they were all kind of still guns and roses but there was this huge brick wall between them and they fucking hated each other or whatever you yeah, know yeah just anyways. you you know it's but then then they get back together because they want to make a lot of money and they play on the Las Vegas strip is that why <laughs> i guess i mean i don't know is when that you why you make a lot of money on you the do, Las Vegas but, strip you do but i feel like that takes that takes the piss out of them a little bit like of course they're going to make a lot of money they're valuable right like they're a <laughs> brand they're valuable yeah. and and you can't take that away from them at the same time, they built themselves on that. And I think there's, I, I gotta think, I want to think very desperately that there's still some drive to just want to rock again or want to get up there and do it. There's that, that emotional attachment to it. And it's like, hey, sure, we're gonna make a lot of money, but I gotta do this. I'm sitting around doing, no, just being rich. Yeah. You know, I feel like you gotta give them a little bit of that. Yeah. Right? I'm like, is there a point where you get so much success? And I talked about it a little bit with my, with my buddies, with like celebrities, like movie celebrities. Yeah. But I wonder if you get to a point where you're so successful, where that drive to create just kind of loses its luster. Make it a goal in life to figure that out. <laughs> really like to figure that out. You know? I mean, that's a good problem to have. If you're sitting around in your mansion, and yeah. be like, us two guys oh. sitting here, it's an, it's an interesting conversation to have. We have no idea. <laughs> you know? How does that feel? You know. Well, you know, what about retiring related to that, right? Hmm. Like, like, uh, I think that people that want to retire confuse the shit out of me. And it, this goes along the same lines, right? These The people you're talking about are really successful They've gotten to a point where they don't got to do anything, right? <laughs> they don't have to do anything. They can just sit on a beach someplace. Some of them choose to do that. Other ones choose to, to do different things and or come back and be that same thing again, maybe for some nostalgia. Yeah. But like for normal folks, I have I, I want to be those guys. Like I would still rather be the old dude that's still doing something, still working. I don't ever see myself retiring. Like I don't ever at some point see myself wanting to just sit for like 20 or 30 years until I die. And I don't know that well, most people do that. They do other shit, yeah. but, you know. Yeah, it's good it's good to have that drive. But what what happens if you're you're 50, yeah. you're 55 and finally your back gives out and you're like, "Oh fuck." <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, there's those things. I think but we don't do it. You know, neither one of us do anything. This doesn't require a little clickety clackety doesn't require my back to be working, but um, or engineering, even if I go back to that full time, you know, but you know, anyways, people that want to retire. Do you want to go back into the music thing or is it kind of like, uh, you're just kind of like happy where you are right now and your, 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 your creative juices are yeah. satiated elsewhere. Well, there's yes to that. Like right now, absolutely. That's true. Like I said, the challenge is a big thing for me. I really like to be, 
I, I don't like it at the time, but when you come out of getting thrown into the fire, right, it's a great feeling. Even if you didn't succeed, even if you failed, you always learn something. Mm-hmm. Um, but the longer answer to that is is that while I was in the music industry as as a staff engineer or an independent guy, I moved between a couple of studios earlier on, right? Like all of those changes were really effing obvious. Sometimes <laughs> I fought them. And then I got my head out of my ass <laughs> and, and went with it, right? Yeah. Like, like a lot of them made a lot of sense. Some of them didn't make any sense at the time. But after the fact, you're like, oh, wow, okay. I'm glad that I, I took the, the whatever that feeling was, right? Yeah. So I have worked really hard to teach myself not to fight the changing winds. And they've changed, right? Like I've got a wife, almost two kids, and... The music industry um, was changing so much from what I was trained to do in it, which is something we could probably talk about for hours. Yeah. But it changed so different. So it's so different now that um, I was struggling to adjust to that and find a business model for that. And I didn't really have the time to go out and be a part of it, right? Or yeah. the interest, really. Like I, I got really bored going to shows and trying to meet people. Like, you know, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, yeah. like, I like people, I like to hang out, and I like to talk to people about new and interesting things, but I don't want to fucking come see your band. <laughs> I, you know, I'm and, the same way. I'm I, the same I, way. I just don't want to come see your fucking band. It's so boring, <laughs> you know, and especially in Nashville, short aside, I've been to some shows outside of Nashville in the last like three or four years. They were amazing experiences, and then I go to shows in Nashville, and they just bore me to tears. <laughs> And that's not the band's fault. That's the crowd's fault. But that's a whole other thing. Um, but, you know, I think I started talking about how I, I was trying not to fight the winds, right? And um, those things in my mind started to change how much I cared about those things. And the industry was changing. And then the technical job kind of showed up as a way to make a lot of really good money, you know? Yeah. And, and, and it's not like I'm doing it just for the money. But it was one of those things like... I can make money at this and it challenges me and it fits into what my life is. So why the fuck wouldn't I do that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's super simple, right? Like, yeah. yes, it's a good job. I have a paycheck that's steady. I don't have to, you know, call Joe and say, Hey man, you haven't PayPal me in like three months. You know, <laughs> I'd like to feed my dog, maybe myself. Uh, um, now it's I gotta feed everybody in the family. Yeah. You know, I gotta help contribute. Well it sounds like you've you've reached a level of perspective that quite frankly a lot of people in the music industry just don't have they just sometimes they get they get they get the taste they yeah. get that one small taste of success which is like a good show i didn't have or, any success i just had a job right like I, I i was able to pay my bills doing something that that i really really enjoyed for a long time i mean we were talking beforehand like you're asking maybe i had some stories yeah and honestly some of the best memories that I have, I don't remember, I think. And, and, <laughs> and the reason I say that is because I, I ended up putting my nose to the grindstone for about five years once I started working at one of the studios I worked at. And it really, I just did it. Like, that was it. That was all I did. I went to work. And, and those were great years. I honestly don't have a lot of stories about them, though. <laughs> I just remember, I have a feeling. No stories of Aerosmith. I never worked with Aerosmith. Or, no, I just I was just saying names. Uh, I don't know who all, I mean, I remember you telling me a story about Young Buck, but we don't have to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Buck. I, you know, Buck was, Buck was a hardworking guy. I liked working for him, but his entourage, I just couldn't, I, I didn't fit well with that i didn't feel comfortable Did they, with all the people around didn't, didn't they bring like a didn't were they like using a real handgun for their soundtrack oh, jesus yeah <laughs> yeah i yeah so i, mean, I can only imagine so you're I on the was, other side of the glass i was already really uncomfortable with the guns being in the studio anyways i was not at that <clears> time very comfortable with guns and yes they were doing that in the mic i was right in front of the glass <laughs> Pointed at my fucking head, basically. <laughs> and I kept telling him, hey, man, can you take the magazine out? He's like, nah, man, it doesn't sound the same. Like, you, okay, it's going to sound you know, pretty bad if you blow my head off. But it was, yeah, that was not fun. That wasn't cool. And when I went to his house to do like one session, I never went back. <laughs> there was guns everywhere. There was guns everywhere. There was guys just calling me, calling me engineer. Yo, engineer, you know, it just, yeah, wasn't my scene. They actually made a friend of mine dance. They pointed a gun at his feet 
and told him <laughs> to dance that crew for real it was a, it was not that is not that a very does not enjoyable sound scene. very fun no it wasn't it really wasn't and mr whitey mcwhite suburbia did not know how to handle that at like 19 years old i didn't know what the god you were 19 on. when I you did that yeah i started in studios when i was 19 wow yep. that's a lot <laughs> that was a, was culture shock. <laughs> it was definitely shocking, but you know. Hang on one second. I need to pause real quick. I just want to make sure. That, yeah. Okay. Cool. Technical pause. <clears throat> yeah. Technical pause. Technical, technical break. <clears throat> Gosh. Uh, so you're not doing the the music thing, and you know you're happy. You, you've yeah. Got, you, I still have yeah. my gear though. Like I, I don't. I don't see it as something I'm walking away from right now. No. I see it as something I'm just not doing at the moment. Remember, I had a job for about a year and a half with the same company, believe it or not, doing something else in the company, and, and um, I didn't enjoy that. I left that gig to go work with the producer that I worked with for about a year and a half to do my, my partner, Mark. Remember Mark? Yeah, Pachia. I remember Mark, yeah. Um, Mark and I were still really good friends, and I left the job to do their record with that producer and then i ended up working for that producer for like a year and then that stopped abruptly <laughs> as but, it sometimes does <laughs> yes yes it did uh i opened the studio though and mark myself had started the studio i still have all that gear and i still plan to keep that, those skills and things going people still call me to mix right now my basement is full of boxes because i just moved but you yeah know, yeah but i will have a studio in the house and i'll be one of those guys and for the longest time, the words weekend warrior, like, like <laughs> boiled in my stomach and, and made me want to, I don't know, it made me feel really bad about myself, but I, I don't care. No. <laughs> like, I really don't care. I know for a fact that I can go into pretty much any studio and make it work and make a client relatively happy, unless they're a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> if they're a douchebag, I don't have the patience for that anymore. <laughs> But, I, yeah, <clears throat> I can only imagine just being in the studio like Blackbird, and oh, that's the one I worked at. Dealing, I'm trying not to name drop Shane. Oh, sorry, I'll I'll edit that out if you don't want me to. <laughs> no, you can you can say it. <laughs> I don't, I you know I, I don't I'm not trying to make it sound like it was bigger than it was, but but it is big. Like Blackbird yeah. is one of the biggest studios in the world. Well, it's definitely got a name for it's the biggest one in Nashville that's still running as like a full-fledged studio yeah. for sure. And then on this side of the country there's not a lot of people that rival their collection of equipment. It really really isn't. <laughs> so, um, I mean they're they're still quite amazing at that. I remember that was the first time I played on a Black Beauty was because of you. <laughs> yeah. And I it was a, you was guys. it a 70 Yeah, you did, man. It was a, it was a, how old are we was gonna, we're not going to talk about the story about how we met, are we? Oh, should we? I don't know. Is that is that I name can, I That's can, name dropping I, in a bad way. I don't know. I have know. a terrible memory because it wasn't like it was because you and Aaron got together first right was it you and kyle it was no it was jordan jordan okay yeah yeah well it was via jordan because i had a connection to jordan via a third party (laughs) oh wait a minute was it was it door banger oh my god (laughs) I forgot. That's okay, sweet. now I so get that, it. So that's a no. shitty inside joke, and we'll move off of it right we'll, now. But we'll, yeah. we'll move off it, yeah. yeah. But yeah, we met through her, and and the first studio you guys worked in in Nashville was Blackbird. Is that right? That was right, yeah. Yes. Th- we had moved. Hell out of you God, guys. man, we had lived in Nashville for maybe two years. Wow. Maybe. I didn't know that. I yeah. thought you were fresher off the boat, so to speak. I mean, maybe two years. That's relatively fresh in the the grand scheme of how long I've been here, which is like 12 years now. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, or a year and a half or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, Johnny was still in the band. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it must have been John. like a year and a half yep. after we had moved. Yeah. And then that was our first studio that we went to is fucking Blackbird. Yep. And I walk into that huge like it was studio a studio a yeah. which was how big is studio a like in <laughs> yeah, i don't know uh, it's it's pretty big i mean you're talking 40 foot long 20 some probably 25 foot at the far end because it's oddly shaped right yeah. and then and that's the biggest part of it that's the most modern half and then the other half was the smaller um more traditional kind of small booth studio but yeah it's uh 
it was, a, I, it was, that was an amazing place. I still I have so many great memories there that I still can't remember. <laughs> like I said, I just every time I think about don't it, don't worry. Like, ah. I, re- I, re- I video recorded all of it, and then you tell me, <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, there was a video. <laughs> there was the dildo video that I almost got fired for. That was great. Well, I didn't know you almost got fired. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I didn't realize that I almost got fired too. But there's a, there is a, you know, the owners of the studio are are. They want things to stay to a certain level of appropriateness, which is tough when you have young bands in the studio hanging out, which at that time they had mostly country people, which I don't know how that's more appropriate, but anyways. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that that came from the manager at the time found it on the internet just because he paid attention to what Blackbird was associated with. <laughs> he emailed me and said, dude, take this down now. <laughs> Because McBride does the same thing that I do, and he checks, and he makes sure that the things that are out there about the studio are good, and if he sees that, you're gone. Like, there's no way. It's a red rocket. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, we had, uh, the story goes, if I can remember correctly, because I, it all blends together. It was a dildo in the studio. Yeah, I mean, we were not, just messing around with it. It's the, actually a pretty normal Because I used studio. to, I used to work at Hustler <laughs> at the time, and so. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so every now and then they'll have to get rid of stuff that's not being sold and they'll give it off to the employees. That's what you picked. I didn't pick it. All right. <laughs> I was just left with it. All right. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. It was like a bunch of DVDs, a dildo. And so we had a little <laughs> game where we would hide the dildo in like a guitar case or like in the yeah. actual acoustic guitar. Yeah. So if you pick up the guitar, so what's 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 in here and you what, and you see this fucking red dildo just in the, in see, the I, yeah, so, now i really miss the studio i really do because you were with with us we were fun yeah you guys were you guys were a blast we always we always work really hard too and yeah. that was i mean just creating the amount of work that we would get done in in a single day with you guys was amazing and um what was that record we did at Jerry Abbott's place mm, at Abtrax? Yes. Now that was well, cool that was too. for your friend in Vegas, right? <clears throat> yeah. He, his band was called his Omnipure. Project. Yeah, Omnipure. Omnipure. Yeah. I still have that in my like shuffle play. It comes on the the. the it was a no good record, man. We did a great job with that record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it sounds fucking fantastic. No, it really I came mean, out great. We used the the Wolitzer. Wolitzer? Wool, wasn't that what it is? Wolitzer? Wurlitzer? You, you, Wurlitzer? Wurlitzer. Is that how you say it? I didn't even spell that. W- with an R. Wurlitzer? <laughs> Can you explain what that is? So we people. It's, a, <laughs> Honestly, it's, an, electric, it's an electric piano or electric key, but it's very old. You know, it's um, before before you had, you know, Casio or whatever. But it, there's, a, there's a strike in there and... Um, there are tines in it, like wooden tines that a hammer strikes yeah. when you strike it, and it's but it's it's magnified by like pickups. Uh, I don't know if there are there are metal tines. I, I guess they would be if it's a pickup in there. I, I can't remember, but you plug it into an amp, and, yeah, and people know the sound like you've heard it a million times. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that was cool. That was that was so fun, was and I was super cool because. It was so cool to like walk into those studios and just know who all recorded there. You Blackbird, know? yeah, or at Blackbird, or at uh, AB, at Abtrax. Abtrax. Well, yeah, Pantera. I that always was, said like AB Tracks. That's Jerry. Like, Jerry is is Vinnie Paul's dad. Yeah. Vinnie and Dimebag Daryl's dad. And, and just to be in that same room is like fucking Vinnie Paul recorded drums in this room. That's yeah. fucking badass. Yeah. <laughs> Vinnie Paul. Vinnie came into town once and was visiting his dad, and we were doing a straight up country session because I did a lot of work for Jerry. Jerry is a he was a close close buddy of mine. He was really good to me when I was. I don't know how it worked out, but anytime I was not working a lot, Jerry needed a lot of shit done, <laughs> and, and he really helped me out. But anyways, I did a bunch of sessions. One time, Vinnie was in town. He stole my compressor settings off the snare drum and that for me was like the oh my god that's like that's so cool i listen you know like <laughs> like this guy i look up to this guy as a drummer you know because yeah. i drum forever i listen to pantera and i love those guys and he's amazing and he's still in my compressor settings this is awesome <laughs> you know, but it's just it's just small victories in life you oh, know th- that was a huge victory what are you talking about <laughs> it's still a huge victory yeah, I don't even, he doesn't you know he didn't care he was just like oh i'm gonna check that out and he i, I imagine that he used that on hell, the Hell Yeah records. Because <laughs> they do all those records themselves, I think. So. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, I, I did a lot of stories about the studio, but I still can't remember. But 
Uh, now I'm really feeling nostalgic. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's always fun to like look back and just be like, man, this is so so f- fun. Yeah, it was, it just was fun, fun, but a lot of it I wouldn't want to do again. Yeah, and again, that, that I was I started I yeah. started the conversation where I kind of don't want to do the the gigging drummer thing. Yeah. I still would love if fucking Keith Urban called and was like, "I right, Shane, we need you. We need you to <laughs> we need you to come to with with me." You know, I'm like, <laughs> all right, man, I'm don't, coming. Yeah, the accent's not necessary. Yeah, sorry. Well, uh, those were cool. I'd worked on a record with him a couple yeah? of times. Yeah, as an assistant, like I wasn't, I wasn't an engineer. I was just a second engineer. I hear he's a super cool dude, super nice. Yeah, I mean, they were awesome Na- Nathan, sessions. Uh, in Five Knives. I don't know if you ever met Nathan. I didn't. Um, but uh, he tours with him. That's what he does. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Good for him. That's yeah. a good gig, man. Yeah, he got touring musician of the year at the uh, CMA. What's his name? Uh, Nathan Barlow. Barlow. Okay. He used to sing for Luna Halo. Oh, back in the day. okay. So I, I would recognize him, but I didn't know that was his name. Okay, that's yeah. cool, man. Yeah. Wow, so Halo's yeah, he's everywhere. he's just killing it, man. He also he's a new dad now. Yeah. Well, we grow up. <clears throat> yeah. We do stuff. Yeah, well, um, I did. I don't know what you're doing. <clears throat> I'll get there eventually. I'll get there eventually. We're eventually going to sell this house and then move up to. We're going to get a farm. Really? That's the plan. Yeah. You want to be then, a farmer? No, I don't want to be a bikes. farmer. No, we're going to use it. <laughs> we're going to get the farm and we're going to use it as an event space. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So Very we cool. want to get into the whole, well, I don't, I mean, my wife does cause she does events and yeah. she's a wedding planner and a planner right. of sorts. And she's so, she's so organized. That is what she does. She is order and I am chaos. <laughs> And we just live in this order and chaos world together. I don't know. The way you've got this shelf arranged, I think this is the order in your life. Or is this, did she do this for you? She did this for me. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. So, all right. Yeah. It's organized chaos. It's organized, organized chaos. chaos. Yes. <laughs> so I have all this shit, and she goes, okay, I'm going to make this look good. <laughs> Speaking of video games, yeah, I have not you, played video games in a long time. Really? Yeah, I don't know. You're missing know. out, my friend. You're missing out. I think I am, but then again, when I try and envision myself spending time doing it, it, it just doesn't compute. Well, you're, you're, also, you're also a dad and a father and a, a, a yeah, husband. I, I and... just let the wife deal with that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I don't know. I, got, I do have a lot of hats, right? Like I wear a lot of hats these days are you a hat collector of no sorts? i mean that <laughs> you know i went from being the full-time music guy quote unquote oh it's a metaphorical hat yeah yeah okay. metaphorical hat. um full-time you know independent music person which meant that at most of the time i was sitting around my ass not doing anything <laughs> and i would fill in the time doing it work for all basically all the studios that i've ever worked at still call me when the internet breaks <laughs> Um, which is fine, you know. Um, so I do a lot of freelance IT work, and then I started doing coaching at at the gym that I go to because I really liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I I do that now. Um, and now I have a full time job, and I still want to do the mixing, and I still do. I actually I still do IT work randomly outside of my IT job, and I coach two to three days a week in CrossFit. And I mean, it's like. <laughs> I don't. I don't really know why I do all that. Do you and Kyle ever cross paths? We haven't yet. We haven't <laughs> yet. No, he's in East Nashville. I'm in South Nashville. Okay. And um, so, are you guys in ever like war, like for territory? No, <laughs> no. no, that's not he's really. He's in the East Side, and I'm in the South Side. Well, think about it. Like, just in terms of people wanting to drive, like nobody wants to drive from East Nashville to any other gym if there's a one in East Nashville, unless yeah. the one in East Nashville sucks, which it doesn't. It's a great gym. Yeah. And um, same thing for our area. Like we have people that have moved out. Actually, we have people that moved away and still drive all the way in from like Hermitage because they like us so much, which is a huge compliment. But in general, you know, just like any other gym, it's there's got to be a convenience factor of if if you don't want to dedicate the time to drive 20 minutes, <laughs> I'm going to go work out. <laughs> and if it's only five minutes away, then that, you know, tip the balance a little yeah. bit more in the showing up thing. So, but yeah, I don't know. I gotta stop doing. I gotta quit something. <laughs> you got you got so you many hats. Like a, yeah, it's, lots of hats. <laughs> you gotta take some off, man. Yeah, husband, <laughs> dad. Uh, the dad thing's fun. I'll tell you that. Yeah. How how old? She's two. She's uh, so my daughter Eleanor is two, and um, our second child is due in three weeks. Um, and she's, we're really crappy at timing for a drummer. <laughs> I'm crap. We're crappy at timing because we. <laughs> 
we, we get, you know, she got pregnant and she said, okay, well, all right, well, do you think we need a bigger house? So we had that whole conversation and we started looking for a house in Nashville, which is really hard. Yeah. Unless you're, you got a lot of money in your pocket to, to make it happen. And, um, we, we talked about it. It was like, okay, if the babies do here, then we have got to make a cutoff point of when we're looking. And we're going to give up looking so that we don't have to think about it until after the baby, unless we find something before then. And of course, okay. right <laughs> at the end of that time, we find the perfect house. The perfect house needs a ton of work. So at the same time as me closing a business, starting a new job, my wife found out she's pregnant. We moved our houses. We kept one house and are renting it to your old singer. And, and... <laughs> And James West, who was on the podcast last. Yeah, I saw that. That's great. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I, I don't know what our problem is, but we apparently don't like to not be insane with shit to do. So. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you actually found a place that you're happy with. Yeah. And because, man, even well, you know two we years ago when we were looking. We looked at the uh, obituaries. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. Um, we we found ourselves in a very good situation. Some really close friends of ours knew a neighbor that had to move out suddenly for mm -hmm. health reasons, yeah. and it just went from there. So that was sort of the situation where we had here, where they didn't put their house on the market, and we were actually yeah. looking at the house across the street. Oh, wow. That's and great. <laughs> he, if I remember correctly, his family was living in this house, and they were um, going to move to somewhere. And but they were they weren't uh, situated there yet, so they mm. hadn't put this on the market yet. So we came over, we looked around the house, and what is that not right? What's not right? He's, he's screwing up the story. I'm screwing folks. up the story. He's screwing up the story. One of the houses were for sale. Uh, like one of the like both of the houses to sell in order for us to get this one. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, right, right. So they had to go. So they, they were incentivized to help you guys out. Or, Correct. Yeah, like yeah. glad to, yeah. So we kind of lucked out, you yeah. know, uh, because we had, I think we put money down, not money down, but we had, yeah, we had uh, tried to buy at least six. Wow. And outbid like yeah. every single time. Just so, some people would put just straight up cash. And just yeah. like 30,000 cash, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thirty thousand dollars. We don't. We didn't. We didn't. We actually. Our timetable was relatively short off the average, but we experienced the same thing. Where there was one house in particular, we th were told by our real estate agent she was really confident. She said, "I think you guys have a really strong offer." Your letter. We had to write a letter, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you guys did that. I think we did that once. Yeah. <laughs> we tried. We, to <laughs> so we. My. So we just got married. So my wife, bless her heart, um, she made a little bit of like a flyer, and it was not really much of a letter. But it was still good. It was got the point across to show the family, and we we lost that one, and we were really I was really devastated by it. Like I, I was, it was a great house. It still would have been perfect for us. Um, it sucks because you yeah. know you you it's, you start envisioning it feels personal. Yeah, you start envisioning your yeah. your life there. Exactly. You're like, oh man, that's where we can set up it's, the, the it's baby. It's a carrier. straight up business decision on the other side, but it feels really personal. And that that whole writing the letter thing is just like twisting the knife. I think like because they all recommend that you do that. They recommend, well, we should write a letter because sometimes it doesn't go for over asking or it doesn't go for the highest bid, which is a horse shit. It goes for the <laughs> highest bid. Yeah. You know, um, it's just like an exercise and some sort of like, I don't know if it's vanity or not vanity, but humility, right? Yeah. Like here, I, I, I humble myself. I'm the one bringing money to the table and I've got to like grovel. What the fuck is that all about? <laughs> That's actually an interesting subject to talk about. I don't know if you ever have thought about it that a no. lot. The whole like, Nashville as a real estate market turning into the gentrified scene, right? Like, yeah, it's been of, happening for a long time. Yeah, but you know, I'm of two minds because on one end you can see gentrification as progress, right? And then the other end you can see gentrification as kicking people out, right? That just can't afford to live there anymore. Yeah, it's it's a deep discussion, right? Like, because I, I I totally feel the same way in that I want progress, I want things to get better, but it seems like there has to be an effort that goes right along with that to ensure that the people <clears throat> that have been in a community for a long time or the, just the, the disenfranchised or the, the poor, whatever, yeah. you know, the, the poverty stricken people that are in a neighborhood that's turning over real estate wise, if the city municipality, whatever the hell it is, state doesn't do other things to help them, 
at the same time, then, you know, you start forklifting a, a poverty issue, a pov- you know, an yeah. income issue and putting them in other places and you don't yeah. fix anything. And it cre- makes it worse if they have to move. Right. Makes it way worse. Absolutely right. Um, um, but it's really, it's interesting to see people have this discussion because the folks that are moving to town now, there's a lot of money moving here. Yeah. And they don't seem to give a shit. No, they don't care because they're and, from and either New like, York or LA I, well, or well that I don't like making blanket statements, but I've had those conversations with people and it scared me, right? Asking the question, just asking, well, what do you think about it? I was like, "Oh, it's progress, things are great. I mean, this neighborhood used to be shit before, yeah. and now all those people are gone." I'm like, "Wow, you're an asshole." <laughs> Like, seriously, you're a prick. You know, you got to have a little bit of a heart when you think about this. I worry about it. That's, I'm of two minds, too. I, I, I want yeah. progress, but I want to make sure that we're helping our neighbors. They're our neighbors. I mean, you, yeah. I mean, it's like it's kind of like the whole conservative outlook on it and the liberal uh, outlook on it, you know? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that um, I think the policy approaches might be able to fall into one of those categories like the policy approach to do one of the other because conservatives and liberals have approaches for income inequality and poverty Mm -hmm. they're different um but i think at the heart they they don't want i really don't think the conservative people i'm I'm pretty liberal so i'll just throw that out there but i don't think the conservative people want to hurt poor people of course not i don't i really don't i don't i think their approach in a lot of scenarios pisses me off <laughs> that doesn't mean that i'm right right that's right. my emotional yeah. response to it and it's the same thing with the gentrification right like yeah. you know and and that's an interesting one because both are doing great on that side right on the gentrification side if you're mm-hmm. coming in in that wave mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if you're conservative or liberal you're yeah. kicking ass right now everybody's taxes next year are going to be great for like the next two or three years um, yeah. In that category of people, but the the poverty stricken people are going to get their asses, asses kicked. kicked. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's crazy complicated. But it's fun uh, to talk but about. I'm I'm, kind of, I'm like I'm not really well versed in the in the gentrif- gentrification uh, conversation, um, and I I should be, but I'm I'm not. But um, but I, I'm thinking of it like this way. Let's say you're you're you live in a house in the center of Nashville, which is and you've lived there for 25 years, yeah. maybe longer. <clears throat> Let's say you've lived there for 30 years. Your house is now valued at $300,000, $350,000 when you bought the house originally for sure. maybe ninety nine. If you own the house. If you own the house. Yeah. Right. If you own So it. if you own the house, then you're making, you're, you're part of that progress, right. whether you're poor or not. Mm-hmm. Am I correct in saying that? Or am I, am I miss... I, I mean, I think that is a really small sliver, and I'm not more versed either. I mean, we're we're talking about this idealistically. Out of right? our I don't ass, have, yeah, if you will, <laughs> idealistically, <laughs> which means out of her ass. Um, but I think that's a really small sliver of it. But that person, you know, it costs money to move. It costs money to to buy another piece of property, and it costs a lot of intangible things to forklift your life. But I don't think that's the primary issue I, I if you own your property that's one scenario i think the more prevalent scenario is that after 2008 right mm-hmm. where we had a lot of people lose their houses yeah and their jobs and had a huge reset in not just the real estate market but a lot of other people's just flat out lives were, were killed by that retirements are gone jobs changed you know we're, Nashville didn't get hit really hard by that stuff, but it affected us. Yeah, Those folks probably don't own a home. They're probably <clears throat> yeah. renting. So you're seeing people that never owned property. Yeah. So, you know, they're, they're below that poverty line in income. They never owned property. They have to rent. Rents are going up in shithole property because the guy knows that he can sell it. Whoever owns it knows that he can sell it for whatever the hell, right? Because mm-hmm. what, what's an interesting thing, I had a buddy who is in commercial real estate development. We talked a little bit about this stuff that happened after 2008. What happened is a lot of a lot of shady shit basically, but a lot of really smart business stuff where people lost their homes. Yeah. So the mortgage market tanked and all these people had to go do what? They needed some place to live. Yeah. So you know what they did? The people that were back in the mortgage loans and doing all that shit, they started buying up properties to rent them. Yeah. I mean, because they had the money. So <laughs> so those are the folks that, that, you know, are getting their asses handed to them. The people that, that don't own property and never owned property. So 
This is sad. It's yeah. It's just fucking sad, and I don't know the answer. I really don't. I do. <laughs> what, what's what, what? What is your solution? Just vote me in, and I'll tell you that. <laughs> vote Netty. <laughs> <laughs> I love that handle, by the way. I that, use it all the time. I, I still it. use it. I really regret that. It, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vote Netty was my my Xbox handle. Yeah. And I lost it. Oh, no. I lost it. I don't know how to get it back. Like, I, there's no way no one, someone else Did is using it. Did you lose it because of inactivity? Yes. Yeah. And then I had to do a, another one when I started playing Xbox Live again um, in 2008. So it was Vote Netty 08, which I thought really flowed pretty well. Yeah, but yeah. now I've lost that one, too. <laughs> so I have nothing to go back to. They're, they're, they're just, you know, let's just ban this guy, Netty. He obviously can't hold on to a handle to save his life. <laughs> it throws the controller too much. <laughs> no. Anyways. Well, uh, I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not particularly a political guy, even though I really love watching debates between very smart intellectual people yeah well, i you love like to watching learn, that right shit. yeah I do and i think I, I encourage more people and i'm not talking about the debates between like a cnn analyst and the fox news stay away from the mainstream shit you don't need to watch oh, that oh trigger you don't trigger i'm sorry mainstream, mainstream media. or fox trigger. Just, fox nbc cnn stay away go to youtube there are plenty of like, oh, awesome hold on no 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 what i mean first off you got to give the institutions credit because if you take the credit away from the institutions at, at a certain level, like down to a certain level, a whole bunch of shit just falls apart. Well, now, I agree. I can't stand to watch Fox News and CNN, but they get the bullet points right and they're out there and they're big enough to go get on scene. I right? mean, oh, yeah, so, maybe. So but you as the, as, the, as the listener or the watcher have to have a really good bullshit filter. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what that, it comes down but no, to. No, but see, if I you disagree. go to fucking YouTube and you prefer Johnny Blah Blah Blah, who no, has no, like, no, no, yeah, I mean, no, no, you're you no, know, that shit I'm, drives me crazy. No, I'm watching YouTube videos with actual either psychologists or okay. uh, not other about the intellectuals. News. Who, are you talking about daily news? Or are you talking hmm? about like subject, like topical matters, like topical matters, okay. like uh, like in full three hour long oh, debates okay. between you know, and it's either like a college holds it between okay. these like two really smart intellectual pundits who are both well, that, on the other side that was never the mainstream media's but that's role. What my point being the reason in mainstream media their ratings are tanking because of this issue where cnn fox news nbc it's very obvious they want to paint a narrative right. yeah absolutely and if you're not fitting in that narrative they're not going to have you on the show it's yeah. just not it's just not that's how it works yes and so that's bullshit you can't do that <laughs> you can what are you talking about <laughs> Capitalism. That's not news. That's not news. <laughs> Absolutely right. And I'm so, not going to say the other trigger that comes right after that, but it's definitely not news. It's like 99% not news. Like you get on, you mute it, and you watch the scroll bar. Because the scroll bar is about as close as you're going to get to information you might actually give a shit about. Because I don't care how many people, I don't care what you say, right? Everyone's just reading the headlines. That's all everybody's fucking doing. Anybody that I know most of the time, anyways. If I actually run into a person that read a fucking article all the way through, <laughs> I am amazed. And I'm guilty of this, too. I, I look for the headlines. It. Yeah. The headlines in most scenarios, all we need. <laughs> this happened today. Right? Like, uh, oh. are you say, Are you saying that headlines can't be misleading? They can be. And that's where your bullshit meter has to be. Right? Like, yeah. um, oh, God, I don't want to use any recent <laughs> tragedies as an example here, but... Without getting into any details so that people get pissed off. Well, the three people that listen to this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's that's the one person who's like, that motherfucker puts it on the Twitter Twitter verse and all of a sudden it becomes huge news. This explicit material podcast is fucking bullshit. <laughs> no, I just I, I, I think you gotta have a good bullshit meter. Everyone's reading the headlines and the headlines serve a purpose to a certain degree. Like this happened today. That's what I want. You know, I really want this happen today. And I want then somebody else, like you said, in in a in an intellectual venue to to break it down. But even them, they're really skewed and you well, have I mean, to yeah, watch but for it's that. obviously biased, but they're biased in a eloquent, articulate way. I love watching articulate eloquent people so, talk okay well, and, even if, if they're if even if they're conservative <laughs> if, or <as> liberal <laughs> so as long as your bias sounds good to me i'm gonna buy that shit uh, okay how about this <laughs> have you ever watched best of enemies no it's on netflix you should definitely watch okay. it it's, bet it's between it's a documentary based on the william f buckley 
Gore Vidal feud in the in the sixties. Okay. And they were intellectuals on the liberal side and conservative side. And you All just right. watch them talk yeah. to each other. We don't have that anymore. No. We don't, well, they, I don't know they, what you're talking about, they, but it they, doesn't they sound like They kind of it. talk like this. Well, Mr. Vidal, if you actually check your facts, you'll know that they, they, they talk like that even though yeah. they're not from England. Why are they not? Why are they talking <laughs> like that? But like, it's really fascinating because they're talking... They're actually debating the policies, and the, yeah. and it, back then, if you were intellectual, the rules were: if you call people names or if you show a tiny little bit of anger, you lose. Basically, well, yeah, I think that's still true today, but people don't hold those presenting that shit to us accountable for it, right? And and it's really hard to hold them accountable for it, for for. You know, and particularly when you look at Fox News and MSNBC, right? Those are, uh, as far as the liberal conservative side of things, pretty much as far apart as you can. Yeah. Everything turns into an ad hominem attack. Right. Every debate turns into, you know, you're not an American or you're stupid for thinking this. And <laughs> and it's it's... What you're talking about is really probably a great example. I should watch it to know, but I've seen debates like that where even if you go back to, to presidential debates, you know, yeah. there was still there was a lot of, you know, jabs in there, but they didn't really go into a lot of personal shit all the time where they just did completely devalued that person by saying, Oh, well, you believe that so you're not American or yeah. so you have no value, you shouldn't be here. That's not right. a conversation, and I, I agree with you. I think that the quality of those debates has gone down. That's but that's why YouTube has the has gone up as far as viewership. Yeah, really, as far as that stuff. Yes, that is that is, it, it's happening because it, it just mainstream mainstream TV in general. Yeah, and people are going to YouTube because. See, I thought you were talking about news from the perspective of oh. journalism and not not the ability to, to look at it because that's not necessarily the same thing right and so I'm, I got confused by I, that and I, I view YouTube and podcasts kind of similarly yeah. where you get the full context of what someone is trying to you, say you can but you cannot too I mean you can futz with a YouTube video just as much as you can a, a news narrative right well I mean that's why I'm saying you gotta have a good bullshit meter I mean, I think you can skew it no matter where. Look, look at the conspiracy horse shit that we're seeing now, <laughs> with with the the yes, Parkland. You have, to the wait, park. you have to wade through so, the so the drag. I don't want to date things, but the Parkland massacre just recently yeah. happened, right? Yeah. Which, which uh, actually, I don't know if they're calling it that, but the school shooting that mm -hmm. happened in Florida, mm -hmm. fucking horrible, yes. right? Yeah, there absolutely. is this like crazy conspiracy theory they're accusing i think this kid's yeah, like 16 or 17 years old of being a crisis actor yeah and it's just blows my mind and and they you know what when you watch these trolls fucking videos mm -hmm. i sit there like huh you know <laughs> you gotta have a strong bullshit meter to yeah. look through that and say this is horseshit this is yeah. bullshit i mean it's possible that this kid traveled to, to like the whole story is he was in california um and was on the news for some other altercation, and I, I don't know if that had something to do with guns, but there was a there was an altercation between some surfers, mm -hmm. and he videoed it and was on the news, and yeah. then oh wait, now he's in Florida. Apparently, he gets in a lot of trouble. He must be a crisis actor. Yeah. Like no, he's probably a rich kid that can travel. You fuck faces, <laughs> like like yeah, and and he. Like the news yeah. would catch that. Yeah. Seriously, it's not. I don't know. Anyways, that. But you well, can yeah, skew the, the. You can skew every outlet. Is all I'm saying. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. But the benefit of of uh, something like a, a a platform like YouTube or podcast or something like that, if you know the person that you're listening to is well, there's trust. You know. see what I'm talking about. That that's huge. Yeah. yeah well, there's I mean, trust in the in the source. Well, you can look through the videos, and then if you have a good bu bullshit meter, you're like, okay, this guy actually knows what he's talking about because he is either a professor or he's a psychologist or he's a he's an intellectual that <laughs> gra graduated from Harvard. So, there, but let's tie this into that faith thing I was talking about with science. It's the same thing, right? You have faith in those institutions, right? Like, if you look at a debate between a guy that's from Yale and a guy that's from Harvard, and it's a topic that you're really interested in, and, you know, you know that those credentials hold value to you. You have faith in that institution to not, to have done their job in creating whatever this intellectual might be, right? Like, mm -hmm. whatever they're talking yeah. about. And I think that, that 
a huge um, kind of not really a red herring, but a big problem with the discussion about the the obvious issues with the media, mm -hmm. right? Is to immediately devalue the news organizations, even CNN and Fox News, right? Um, by uh, you know just discounting them because of because of certain things it's really easy to do i think that you need to look at them and understand their skew and understand the reasons why they do that and still make sure that you balance by looking at everybody i mean watching fox news every once in a while mm -hmm. i really do i i think it's really important not to just be able to say oh well, that one professor out of harvard said this shit so fuck harvard you know <laughs> like you yeah. know uh what, what was bill o'reilly right bill yeah. o'reilly and the head of Fox News, um, what's his face? Sheld, not Sheldon Allison. Was that who's the head of Fox News that got ousted? I, Bill O'Reilly got ousted I, I can't because remember. of sexual harassment yeah, allegations. Yeah. So fuck Fox News. They sexually harass everybody. But then again, Matt Lauer. Yeah, was that NBC? Fucking <laughs> NBC. Fuck NBC. What are we left with at that point? Is my is what I'm saying. Well, you're left with alternative media. That's what you're left with. I don't see, but I don't know how to trust alternative media. I mean, you don't you don't trust them blanket blanketly. No. But that's I say it, yeah. you have more you have more of a shot of finding out bigger context with you know okay. with with a more plethora about, of different people that are saying. What about Vice? You know, Ooh, I have a see, there's a Vice. great reaction right there. Uh, yeah, you see, yeah. I, I I used to really like Vice, and I still do, but I just watched a, a YouTube video where they did some little tricky editing to uh, one of the psychologists that I follow, Jordan Peterson. And he said something that was relatively controversial about makeup in the workplace. And he was, as an intellectual, just like questioning, you know, if you watch the full 17 minute long video, which right. they didn't release, they yeah. only released six minutes of it. Okay. It, in the six minute video, it makes him look really bad because he's taught, you know, it makes it look like he's saying, uh, women shouldn't wear makeup in the workplace, which is not what he's saying. He's talking about, we don't know what the rules are. We've only been working together, men and women, for only 40, uh, 40 years. Oh, interesting. You know? Okay. You know? So, we, he's saying, we can't have a real conversation about how we work together without someone, without someone accusing someone else of being a monster. And he said, you know, he just was, he just says, you know, what about, here's a rule, what about no makeup in the workplace. Mm -hmm. He's just asking questions. And so that triggered the the, the interviewer Trigger. a little bit. The interviewer kind of just went, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. And then it kind of devolved into there. So you watch the six minute interview, it makes him look bad. You watch the 17 minute long interview, it's it's a lot. You still may not agree with him, but, but, but he more was, there was more context to it. Yeah, yeah. so he's, he's a, he, like I said, he's an intellectual, he's thinking so, out loud, he's like trying to figure out. This is your out. bullshit meter kicking in. And that's kind of what I was talking about because I like Vice News' perspective on things is very liberal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very liberal. And they do go to the places where shit's happening. Like yeah, your interviews. That's why I really like, like them. Like they they go to Syria for crying out loud. Yeah. That chick that went to Syria like <sighs> more than once for crying out loud. <laughs> that's fucking is insane. fucking crazy. And that's that's the kind of stuff that we definitely yeah. need. But the, even with that insane effort to go to the story and to get the information, they have thirty minutes, and you got to turn that bullshit meter on because yeah. especially when they talk about guns. You know the fucking. It's just it just pisses me off. I know that they're they're skewed and it's not helpful to the conversation and at large when yeah. they do that and it's so obvious. But yet they still went to the place and they did give me some headlines, some snippets of things that helped me understand it. But I got to go through the bullshit meter. I got to really. You have to do that with every outlet, you know. Yeah. And I I want to do that with CNN and Fox News just as much as I do there the, was, the YouTube guys. There was a. Again, a, a panel that I watched on YouTube, and it was an hour, two hours long, where they talked about, uh, I'm going to say himself. it, I'm going to say it, they talked about, quote unquote, fake news, or just the news in general, and how to improve yeah, the news cycle. Which is just such an important discussion. You know, and it was great, because yeah. they put out some really great ideas, none of which I can remember right now, but I'll watch it again. It's <laughs> like my studio <laughs> stories. Yeah. No idea what happened, but I felt really good about it. <laughs> I felt really good about it. I was like, Yeah. You know, but um, a lot of it was just taking, you know, if you have bias, just putting it out there in the ether first. I think that was what it is. I think that's what one of the, the, the policies that were uh, talked about and just say, hey, look, I'm a, I'm, this is bias this is obviously conservative or liberal. And these are 
Mm-hmm. The, or, or separating it. These are these are the facts that happened, and then now I'm going into the op-ed. Mm-hmm. You know, something like that. I don't know. Uh, it was, but it was it was you know it was informative. Yet I don't retain that information <laughs> because I'm terrible at retaining information. <laughs> I, I I think that uh, I I don't want to be like a crotchy old man and think oh man things are getting worse and worse. But we've got some things boiling to the top and boiling over. You know, I think the current administration is the greatest example of that. Mm-hmm. I think that Trump won because there was a an intellectual movement during the years of President Obama mm-hmm. and before that that really was not connected to um, the rest like, of America. Like, yeah, the flyover states. Yeah. Really, that that whole flyover state comment thing, where. You know, those people are the are, are pissed off, rightfully so. Yeah. And uh, what's really what really puts value to that is when when they talk about the numbers of people for the primary sake, like in the primaries, when mm-hmm. it comes to looking at Bernie's performance and Trump's performance, and uh, asking voters, you know, who didn't have Bernie as an option. A shitload of them voted for Trump. <laughs> yeah. Because they just wanted a change. Yeah. And so there's stuff boiling over and there's a lot of good conversations happening. So there's some encouraging Finally, things happening. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's happening with some some huge steps back for society with the whole approach of, you know, you know, you're not allowed in my country and the immigration issues yeah, yeah. and, and the, the racism issues that have come out and the sexism issues that are just right in our face because we have a like freaking frequent sexual assaulter as a president, you know, <laughs> totally legitimate president is now okay for him to be, you know, an outed douche. <laughs> um, you know, but anyways, I mean, that's, we don't need to go down that road. We, is there happier stuff to talk about? I don't know. Probably uh, personally, you know, like I think perspective is important. We, we touched on it perspective in your life. Yeah. And I think, you know, I was just thinking about this the other day. I was like, you know what? Obviously, you know, being poor or being in poverty sucks. And, I, you know, I, I feel and I am empathetic and sympathetic to that point. Mm. However, I do. I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, because I walked through Walmart the other day and I'm like, HD TVs are $100 now. They used to be like $4,000. Yeah. So, you know, uh, a poor person who lives in poverty now has an HD TV. Cars are cheaper than they've ever been. Uh, so I'm just, I'm, again, I love playing devil's advocate. So I was just thinking huh. about that. I was like, yeah, that's, you know, there are obviously some, uh, there's obviously issues in being in poverty, but is it better now to be in poverty now than it was 40 years ago? Considering the goods and services have now updated so and we, a, everyone kind of can live in air conditioning and you know uh, you know like everyone can live in air conditioning well i mean that's a this big is deal the, the guy from from vegas saying that yeah like <laughs> we air conditioning is very important in <laughs> yes, vegas all right <laughs> um well i think that w- the answer to your question at least in terms of the united states yeah. is most certainly Yes, per capita, right? Like if you were to go out and look at, you know, the the results of people's lives, it probably would be. I don't have those numbers. I don't know. But yeah. my, my gut feeling is that that's absolutely true. But what's the next part of that statement, right? Like the next part of that statement is where people differ. Right. Sure. I think most people recognize that, again, we're talking about in the context of the United States of America, you know, the poor people now are probably and this is a sh- i think it's a shitty thing to say really because yeah. of the next part of the conversation are better off than they were you know at some other time in our history right but if you know if progress is something we talked about earlier where we we really want to see progress and with with the progress that we made in technology and the progress that we've made in all other aspects like society and the things that we understand the things that we the the, the values that we hold now like you know if you go back far enough back certain people weren't equal to a whole person yeah you know? oh yeah and that wasn't that long ago in our right. history yeah. right but now we don't have that so that's great right mm. ah, no <laughs> no there's just a lot of shit that we still need to do just because you if you work at a really low income job and you can afford an hd tv doesn't doesn't really take yeah. away a lot of other 
systemic issues and other things that hold you down. I mean, we are a capitalist, you know, economy, right? Yeah. And the way our economy worth works is growth. And the ideals of America is also growth and upward mobility and change. You know, right. people at one point when they immigrated to the United States would measure the success of their family by what generation, you know, what the next generation was able to do. We always want better for our kids. Mm -hmm. And that is where a fuckload of people are stuck in the mud. There are families and there are whole swaths of people that have no chance of making improvements. So yeah, technically they're better off, but they're not fucking going anywhere. Yeah. Well, I'm going to bring up a conservative talking point oh, at this fuck. point. I mean, well, well, I'm just saying it's a, it's an interesting talk. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate. I love playing devil's advocate. It's fun to me. Okay. Because it's a, it's me too. an interesting talking point. So let's say is personal responsibility not, uh, not part of that conversation. Of course it is. Okay. It's ridiculous to suggest that it's not. Right. So yeah. at what point does the go is it the government's job to support, let's say, someone who so, has kids out of wed wedlock, they have kids when they're 16, they're not educated, you know, who's... Ooh, who, wow. Like, hey, uh, these are some tough ones here. I mean, wow. that's what I'm... I, I, Jesus, I'm just, I'm Rush just, fucking I'm, Limbaugh just walked in the room. <laughs> sorry, I'm just... I would listen to something like that. start dropping okay? anchor is babies it, and everything. Is it the government's job to to, you know help with the bad decisions of others there's no black and white answer to that you know why you know why because the government of this country was formulated to reflect the people at any given snapshot in time the zeitgeist of the time determines that answer and right now the answer is no <laughs> no I'm, I'm serious we elected a guy yeah. that says no. no eight years prior to his administration we elected a guy that said yes yeah. And they worked toward those ends. Right. So, you know, if you're talking about the government, then that changes with the dude that's sitting in the office and the dudes that are sitting in power. And we make that decision over long terms of time. Right. That's not a short, immediate change. Uh, and the even longer view of it is it's not the government's responsibility by like some sort of mandate, like. Oh. Uh. Like above, <laughs> ab from above and beyond, in yeah. my opinion. It's society's growth mm -hmm. and progress <laughs> that determines those things right. and, and over the course of our history we have grown the size of 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 what we think society should help people do and it has enabled many many people to do great things and it has enabled many many mediocre people to be totally mediocre, but happy Americans yeah. and consumers of goods and and live healthy lives, right? Like, right. it's it's the whole personal the personal responsibility thing. Like you're talking yeah. about the bootstraps. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't I don't agree I with have, that. I, I didn't have any help. I, I I pulled myself up by the bootstraps, yeah. and now I'm a congressman. It's like, no, you're an asshole. <laughs> Everyone helps you. You got a yeah. Pell Grant. You had a teacher that has stayed late. You had a parent that showed up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that's horse shit. That bootstrap argument. Oh, and beyond yeah, I don't that, like it. there's always personal choice. But we're right. not talking about one individual. We're talking about a, a, a large groups of people. Right. You know? So, but wouldn't it be again? I'm just I'm just saying like what's a better solution? So I'm just trying to find solutions here. Okay. So from a governmental standpoint, I do think I do think that there's the government's responsibility to hold safety nets mm -hmm. for people i yeah. really do you know i'm not huge on the social security thing but but the concept of of creating those nets for people like you know um is it medicaid i always mess them up medicaid, medicaid and medicare yeah medicaid and medicare medicare i think is for for elderly people right i think where so, yeah. medicaid is for poverty stricken people mm -hmm. you know those safety nets if you were to rip them out or phase them out within one decade even, right. you would fuck a lot of people. You know what? I was actually playing with... Have you ever heard of this idea? And I, uh, Elon Musk is a big proponent of it because eventually we're going to need it. Is universal basic income. That's exactly what I was driving towards. Yeah. I don't know enough about it to speak super intelligently. But, how but it, awesome seems like, it seems like the experiment is working yeah. in a lot of places. But they're small scale. Yeah. That's very, I mean, the thing about the United States, when you compare us, what we can do from a federal government level, 
to other countries, especially in Europe, European countries are the sizes of our states. Yeah. So those systems have to scale to 320 million, million people, people. Yeah. or something like that. It's over 300 30, something million. Is it 30 million? I don't know. Is whatever. it 300 million? At, the, know. The, the, at that it point, doesn't matter. I can't but, count that high. Yeah, I, I thought about like <laughs> that would be a really good compromise because you have at one end, let's say it'll get rid of welfare. You know, we'll just say we, we don't have They don't wealth. see that as a compromise at all. They see that as losing the war. Right. But if you want, if you, yeah. Conservatives. Conservatives, yeah. yeah. But I think eventually we're going to have to need it because robots are going to take <laughs> our jobs. <laughs> what the fuck just happened? No, I'm telling you. I'm, because I'm robots serious. are going to take but over. But look at it. They're starting to have kiosk McDonald's. So <laughs> th- there's, there's two. Just the way you said that. Just, <laughs> robots. You got really excited about robots. <laughs> robots. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they, I mean, eventually technology is going to take over jobs that, you know, are menial. It's been and doing it for over a hundred years. So there is going to come a point where, you know, redneck Joe doesn't know how to work a computer. So, you know, what is he going to do if he doesn't have the correct tools to work at jobs now? Just yeah. like regular jobs. Right. I think, well, you know. <laughs> Yeah. There's a lot of different talk, ways to talk about that, though. There's a lot of different ways to talk about that. I mean, if you're talking about a social um, secure, social like security net or whatever they want to call that, yeah. like the universal income thing, yeah. um, that's not meant for children necessarily. That's meant for you know c- citizens that are out there in the world, right? right? You get it at a certain age, and it's supposed to help you pursue things and not have to worry about money. Um, but when you're talking about you know Joe. Well, let's look at the coal miners, which is a really good current example of that, right? Mm-hmm. Their industry is dis- disappearing. It's right. flat out disappearing for many legitimate reasons. Yeah. It's going away, not the least of which it's a, it's a really dangerous and very unhealthy profession, mm-hmm. um, you know, as evidenced by cavens and the health issues that they have. Yeah. But, you know, those guys have a great skill at what they do to do what they do and be as safe as they are and get it done. But they're not trained to be, you know, electrical engineers, right? Right. And and I, I think in the coming decades, it's quite obvious that we're going to need, we're not going to need a lot of as many physical, manual, labor type people. We're going to need support people. Mm-hmm. We're going to need support desks. We're going to need people that understand the computer systems that were developed by maybe someone else or people developing those systems. Right. Like you said, you know, the, with as you will so eloquently put it, the <laughs> robots. robots. Yeah. <laughs> the robots but that's those are those are two different spokes in the wheel right like i i you know i i have heard a bunch of different stories where they're doing that i think they're doing that in canada someplace they're doing that in um, scandinavia a bunch yeah you know um and i i'm really excited to hear what they say um there have been some cities in the united states that have done it too um they had like income caps um Mm. these again small samples yeah and um but it's 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 an interesting idea. But that is is the economy changing enough to support that? Is what I would say. I don't know in a whole lot of, about economics, but from what I'm seeing, the way the economy works is going to have to change to scale as well, with the interconnectivity of the world's economies. You know, the globalization argument, which I really have a very vague understanding yeah of. i i, I do too but that apparently is, england that's didn't huge... want to england didn't want to be a part of it with brexit they were like we're done we don't want to Which have anything a to do shitty idea by the way <laughs> just just when you use a calculator it was a bad idea but um yeah i i mean i don't know if if that is there's no one thing that's going to help right yeah. like that'll help poverty stricken people it'll raise taxes so other things in the economy will have to adjust or you know for those taxes and other things will need to get cheaper. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. We're talking about shit we don't know anything about. Yeah, I know. We're just, what do we, we just, know about? I don't know. We just went down this road. Yeah, yeah. We just went down we're this way political down this road. road. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see how much time we have left. Okay, we have 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes to talk about what? Well, I don't know. What do you want to talk about, bro? Well, we didn't talk a lot about the one thing I was worried we'd talk a lot about. <laughs> well, what was that? CrossFit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. I, I, you are a better man than me to do to to, to do the CrossFit. The CrossFit. The like CrossFit. It's some, yeah, but you know. I, I just can't. I it, I can't do it, man. Why? Yes, well, you can. I mean, I well, can. Well, well, I can. I'll but say that's bullshit. I, I yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you for calling me out on that. But um, <laughs> I, I just 
I used to work out a lot. I think I'm, I was actually doing P90X when we were doing, uh, when we were recording with you. But uh, yeah. like, and then I did Insanity for a while. <laughs> and then... Terrible I names. Just, yeah, what? Those are terrible names. <laughs> Insanity! P90X! Yeah. Um, but then what... I, what happened was when I was working out and doing all these like extraneous exercises, I would be, I would get really hungry. And then when I'm hungry, I'll eat anything. Yeah. Just get uh, fried foods, just yeah. milk, fucking everything. <laughs> give it, milk. give me calories, <laughs> ice cream. I don't care. Right. And I would actually gain a whole bunch of weight. I was making gains, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> but I wasn't like, I wasn't getting the, the, the cut that I needed, the you know, cuts. that I cut that I wanted rather. Well, I, I'll say that, you know, uh, I started off just being a dude that did CrossFit and really being shitty at it. And I'm still kind of shitty at it, but I started to really enjoy the coaching side and the coaching side has enlightened me to just how many different, the different struggles that people have, like no one person's the same. Yeah. Right. But first off, you can't out train a bad diet. And, and oh, yeah. that's the thing that I think everybody now is starting to realize that the food we eat is dog shit. Yeah. And, you know, I really that... not good for you in general. And then cr- CrossFit's intense workout is completely an aside from that. Right. Like, yeah, I did CrossFit for two years before I changed my diet. And those two years were, were a struggle. Like I was in and out. I didn't really stick with it. I wasn't feeling good. And until I, I changed my diet with, with this like challenge that the gym did it was just i, I latched onto it Lori and i did we, we lost a bunch of weight started to realize what we were eating and that we didn't need to eat it but it was a struggle right to mm-hmm. not eat the i guess fried chicken in your scenario but uh, <laughs> in my case it was just a lot of carbs and yeah, stuff like that yeah. and that, that changed my life I mean, it really did and, and i'm not trying to get all bougie about it but it made a huge difference in how i felt day to day yeah. And I feel, you know, I feel like that's the universal thing that I see in all one the thing that I, I one thing that I was really um really surprised me about diet cuz I learned about, you know, I I learned that the hard way where I was working out and I was I was gaining and I I didn't care about the diet and I was just eating whatever the fuck I wanted. Well, you were young too, which is <laughs> Yeah. And then yeah. and uh and then I stopped working out, but then I focused on diet because I stopped working out. And right. just by focusing on taking out sugar, mm-hmm. lessening the That's carbs, the thing. sugar. N- try not to eat so much bread, um, if at all. Yeah. And just uh just focus on like protein and, and fats and you know, good fats anyway. Right. Um and that really changed him. And my face thinned out. And I think my yeah. my face thinned out yeah. just by stop drinking Coke. I yeah. used to drink Coke. I used to drink like six Cokes a day. Yeah, I'm not me too. dead serious. When I first, yeah, when I was in the music industry, we had shitty hours. I would drink like seven Mountain Dews a day, man. Are you kidding me? And eat bagels all goddamn day. <laughs> you know, just because it was what was there. It was yeah. free because I was broke. But, right. you know. Another that, thing too, what do you what do you think about this uh, intermittent fasting uh have you ever heard about that? Yes, and I don't know much of them. It's like keto, I guess. A keto diet, isn't it? What well, it is? Or is that no, intermittent fasting is different. Can go I think it could probably go along with that, but intermittent fasting is just that. It's it's intentionally fasting um to I don't know if you're trying to achieve a oh, ke- I do keto it. state, but no, I mean, the ketogenic keto state, ketogenic but. diet is where you're you're switching your body's energy system or what it's what its primary source of energy is mm-hmm. over from the carbs, the sugars, right? Like right. Uh, glucose and dextrose or whatever those simple sugars are that yeah. your muscles consume over to the fats where it's breaking down the fats first instead of last. Right. And I think, I think they used to call it starvation mode, right? Where you didn't have any food. So your body would flip over and start converting its fat. Mm-hmm. And um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I don't know a lot about a whole lot about it beyond that. But the thing, is, the thing for me is that, if it's if it's too complicated, most people won't do it. And those are those are regimens for people that I think are either athletes or already have a certain level of dedication. Yeah. Well, I I started doing that. Well, I just started doing that anyway because I really don't eat breakfast. I, I really don't really eat until it's the maybe, most important meal of the day. I mean, you should have your I corn don't. pops. I, I just I just that's how I I just started being like that, and then I started <laughs> really thinning out and losing weight. You've always been like that. I've always been. Like that. <laughs> um, but I started really like thinning out and losing weight yeah. and not even trying, you know, I wasn't working out. I was, you know, I'm on my feet most of the day for work, but, yeah. um, you know, I only have two meals a day and I'm, 
sometimes I eat. Like sometimes I'm just I'm so hungry. I'm going to eat like a thousand to yeah. to, to fifteen hundred calories in one meal. Yeah. And then I'll eat dinner, which will probably be a little bit more healthier because we eat at home. But uh, at work, I eat there, and sometimes I get a little overboard. Um, but uh, <laughs> but then I don't eat for, till you know from six to the next day when I eat at noon. You right. know, that's at what seventeen hours worth of is sixteen hours. Yeah, that's, a, that's you know, sixteen hours a fast, of, yeah. of, of no no food. Yeah, and then see what it's been reinforced by by the government by you know the the food agency pretty yeah. recently that their original food triangle was a whole bunch of horseshit. <laughs> yes, right? it was. Because it was the idea of the triangle or the pyramid, right? The food pyramid. The pyramid. Was to build on top of things below it. And it was like wheats and grains at the bottom of it, which yeah. is you can you can never eat wheats and grains and be a very extremely healthy person. <laughs> Actually, you will be healthier if you don't. But that is... I hear so many people talking about it now, which is kind of exciting that we're realizing yeah. that wow, there's there's so much, so much just stuff in our foods. Just you know why empty, that is? Empty calories. Why? Podcasts, YouTube videos. <laughs> right, well, we don't have to get in the weeds on that one, but I think it's exciting for me yeah. because I've gotten into to to doing coaching and watching people go through this journey, whatever it is for them to either try and get healthier, or lose weight, whatever it might be. Yeah, and. They they are all talking very similarly about the most crucial thing, which is their diet, and that's yeah. that's it, again. I worked out for two years. I was never. I marched band. Okay, <laughs> I played in rock bands. I was a scrawny little dude, and I still am. But I feel much healthier now. And it was really all diet. Like CrossFit alone would not have made the change. Like that activity is still really important to me, but food dude it's it's all been food and like That's, quality of food yeah the you know not like organic is a wishy-washy world but yeah. it's it is supposed to be better for you because they're higher quality but i mean we, we just don't eat enough dirt anymore we don't eat enough just green stuff seriously yeah. we, we need those minerals and that's the shit that people are missing out on. Like, yeah. You chow down on, on a Snickers bar. You're like, oh, man, there's a bunch of stuff in there. Uh, you know, it's, it's calories that you don't need. It's calories that you yeah. don't need. You're starving your body of the shit that you need that, to, to make it function. So that's the biggest thing for me. Plus, I like to lift stuff that's heavy. <laughs> makes you feel good. I, makes yeah. you feel like a man. Well, sometimes. <laughs> Most of the time, it makes me feel like an idiot. <laughs> like, I shouldn't have tried that. <laughs> but it's, it's a feeling of accomplishment. So yeah, I'm, I'm like I look at you and I look at Kyle and I'm like, man, I just the the amount of respect that I give you guys for oh, doing the you. the things <laughs> that you do because Kyle puts like uh, videos up on his Instagram. Of yeah, he him likes to just show do, off. He's just showing off, but you know, <laughs> it's still it's still impressive. I just, it is just, but he's been cut his whole life, man. Yeah, that guy's always been healthy. Yeah, that motherfucker. Yeah, he's, you know when we were kids, he would call me fat. That's why I have a complex. It's because it's because of Kyle. We don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. You guys are horrible to each other. Yeah, we really are. Why are boys just so mean to each other? Oh, I guess bands. girls are too. Bands. bands. Yeah. But it's a, it's a rite of passage. You got to be able to take it, you know? I got a studio story along those lines. Yeah, yeah. So, studio story. Give me so, a studio story. So this is not... We'll close on this. Yeah, we'll close so this on. is not very exciting, but because it, it doesn't involve really famous people. Okay. But no, no road guys road. versus studio guys is always a thing, right? Like road engineers, road techs, the guys that go on tour and do touring stuff. Um, the, 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 everything from the stage hand up to the guy that's mixed in front of sound. It's a totally different world, and it's not the studio. It's like the Marines or the army grunts, right, <laughs> against the Air Force that gets to sleep in their own beds every night, right? Yeah. And, and they're both crucial, and they have their own role, but they're very different, and those guys are gruff, man. They're tough to hang out with. So I first started working at Blackbird as a really young guy. I was like 21, um, never toured. I'd only worked in studios, never even went to really college. I went to like a tech school for recording. So my experience with, with lots of different people was pretty limited at that point, except for Young Buck, because that was enlightening. <laughs> but these guys, I got a job at Blackbird. I was wiring with them because they were still doing construction. And these guys were tough, man. They were tough on me. They were ridiculously mean. Um, there was one scenario where this guy, 
I, I, I think I'll never remember what the conversation was about, but I like got a little jab at, you know, just, you know, I do it all the time. Yeah. Most of the time they're not funny at all, but, <laughs> but this one grabbed a hold of him and I got a little jab in and the guys snickered. There was like four <laughs> other guys at the table and this guy is, you know, a big, huge road guy. They're typically really big dudes. Yeah. So they have to be pretty strong. And, uh, he got really quiet for, for like five, 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden he, he came at me. He was like, listen, you fucking whatever. And he started threatening to bounce my head off the parking lot outside because I was speaking out of turn. Right <laughs> now, what I didn't know what there was, there was another wiring guy behind me that was not holding it in very well. Cause he, this guy was fucking with me entirely. Like he, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean it at all. He didn't mean anything. He was just messing with me. I guess they liked me. I don't know. I think they did, but they they didn't act that way. <laughs> this guy, he held it. The guy to my right held it for about, I don't know, 40 seconds or something like that before he started falling over. But yeah, that's a studio story. I just, <laughs> like, I, I, I could never deal with that road guy thing. Anyways, what got me on that? Cut that out. I have no idea what got me on that. It wasn't even that great of a story. It's an interesting memory. What were we talking about before that? Uh, we were talking about CrossFit. CrossFit. Which we actually stopped talking about CrossFit. Which Look is great. That. Well, because diet's more important. <laughs> we talk- <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I think we'll, I think that's good. We've got an hour and a half in. Holy I, shit, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope that was interesting That was somewhere. great. That was great. I'm so glad that you finally got out here to do this, yeah. man. I'm glad, and I hope we'll do it again. I would love to come back and actually talk about music stuff. We it, didn't talk about music stuff at all. We talked about it for about 40 <laughs> minutes, and then we veered into politics, yeah. and then we veered into CrossFit. Yeah, maybe I should, I should start playing video games again. I should go back and play all the video games that I remember playing, and then come back and have you expose to me what the world is like now. Because <laughs> I haven't a clue. I, I do play. I do play. Uh, I, don't pl- I, I only have like a couple hours out of the day to play, because I wake up up in the morning before I go to work and I play. I get that. I get my fix in in the morning. And then I go to work and then I come back and then I work on videos or you know what have oh, you. But I wish I had. I mean, my schedule is so weird now. Well, uh, do you like? Okay, I'll, I'll get. I'll give you. I'll give you a video game to start back with All or right. to start with. I don't know if you played it, but is it's it called, a role playing? No, okay. it's an open world game like GTA. You play those oh, okay. games? Okay, uh, yeah, I have. I what, was, what games were you into? I was into always first person shooters. First person shooters. Yeah, I was not a very, very educated or you know deep video game player. I just well, wanted to kill things. Everyone, wa- everyone's playing Overwatch right now. Overwatch. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there you go. There, mm-hmm. there's your video game to play. I don't play first person shooters because I'm terrible at them. Oh, see, so yeah, I'm I don't terrible like... at the other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Overwatch. Cool. Or Doom. The new Doom. Doom is back. Yeah. The new Doom is back and it's fucking awesome. You want to listen to a great soundtrack, dude? Listen to that. Really? Listen. To, it's it. It won all these awards. It's on iTunes. If you want to give it a shot, just like Doom soundtrack. Like this dude actually. I guess what if I remember correctly, this is what Kyle told me. If I remember what Kyle told me, is that the the guy who created this one guy, mm-hmm. guy who created this music, he wanted he 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 wasn't. It's all metal. It's basically a metal electronica soundtrack. It's yeah, incredible. Um, and he wasn't happy with the guitar sound he was getting. So what he did was he blended an actual chainsaw sound <laughs> with the guitar That's sound. Great. And it's, it's the most brutal guitar sound I think I've ever heard. <laughs> it's so brutal. Just like the engine or was it cutting something? It was like... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That's what it was like. It was okay. just... I can only do sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, well, Well, thanks. thanks. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on, man. Good to hang.